Hi Ethics students and other interested folks. I'm going to give you a brief overview today of some research that I published in 2005 on the practical model of ethical decision making based on Kantian deontology for use in issues management. This was published in the Journal of Public Relations Research and it is based on a normative model that I published the prior year, but I went to the global pharmaceutical firms I was working with and got their feedback. So they wanted something more practical, more like a flow chart. So I developed the model that we're talking about today, the practical model, to make it more like a decision tree, very user friendly, so that you don't have to know a lot of ethical theory to implement this form of moral decision making based on Kantian deontology. So, the philosophy of Immanuel Kant is based heavily on moral autonomy and individual rational decision making. So, we start at the section that says start here, the autonomy section, and we have a few considerations to rule out to make sure that you're truly a morally autonomous decision maker, meaning that you're making the decision based on moral principle and what's right alone rather than prudential self-interest or other consequentialist types of outcomes. So can you rule out political influence, monetary influence, and pure self-interest such as what's going to make you look good or even what you're afraid of, a fear of a reprisal or something like that? If you can rule out those things, then your moral autonomy seems to be okay and you can go forward with making the decision on the yes arrow. If you cannot rule out those influences, you have to defer the decision to another issues manager or you have to use a group consensus decision making process so that you can discuss that subjectivity and have others gauge with you what the actual moral autonomous thing is to do that's completely based on rational objectivity. In either form of that decision making, then you move forward to the question section. This one is based on three questions that should help you rule out other influences and think about how the decision will be made going forward. So could you, you or your group obligate everyone else who's in a similar situation to do the same thing you're about to do? This is the universal law of autonomy, meaning it brings in a universal consideration. If you could obligate everybody to do what you're about to do, would it still be ethical, right, fair, morally autonomous, unobjectionable, not infringing upon the rights of others, and so on? The next question is, would you, or we if it's a group, accept this decision if you were on the receiving end? This brings in reciprocity and empathy and moral sensitivity into the decision, making sure, again, that you're not infringing upon the rights of others. If you wouldn't accept the decision, or if you would feel odd about being on the receiving end, that's a red flag. That's an indicator that something may be wrong with the decision options and you need to do some more research. So the final question in this section, have you faced a similar ethical issue before? So thinking about the past in terms of virtue ethics, because we know that deontology is a more modern iteration based on ancient virtue ethics, looking at hindsight, looking at what you've learned from the past, looking at character and integrity, also looking at the policies of your organization, looking at the mission statement and your core values and seeing if what you're about to do resonates and aligns with those things. It's very important to make sure that it does so that you're speaking with authenticity and consistency. Then after answering those questions, you can move forward to the ethical consideration triangle that you see in the next part of this flow chart. The ethical consideration triangle is actually Kant's categorical imperative in each of its three forms. And each of those three forms of the categorical imperative is at one point of the triangle. And inside of the triangle are large groups of stakeholders and publics and people we would want to consider in that decision and get research and feedback from to make sure that all points of view have been considered. This is not meant to be an exhaustive list of stakeholders. You'll have to fill in specific stakeholders according to the individual decision that you're facing, but it's just meant to remind you who's involved in the decision.
And you look at each of the involved groups in the middle of the triangle with each of the points outside the triangle. So form one of Kant's categorical imperative, are you doing the right thing? That is the duty form. Act on the maxim that you could will to become a universal law in all similar situations for all time. So that's the universal norm, talking about duty and moral principle. Are you doing the right thing? And I think that form of the categorical imperative is probably the most well-known. But we have two other forms to also consider, and an ethical decision is only ethical when it can pass all three forms of the test. The second form is the dignity and respect form. So does, does the decision or the potential decision maintain dignity and respect for all of those involved? Thinking specifically about those groups in the triangle and those that you have segmented out to talk with in conducting research and understanding every perspective on the situation as much as possible and putting yourself in the shoes of all of those various publics and viewpoints as well. That way you make sure that you're no longer biased in trying to influence the outcome but you're seeing it as rationally in a detached and objective manner as possible when you're able to weigh the decision based on merit and principle alone. Then finally, the third form of the categorical imperative, the third point of the triangle is intention. Are you proceeding with a morally good will or acting from goodwill alone? Good intention is definitely the highest test in the categorical imperative. Only those decisions made from good intention are, in this form of philosophy, morally worthy or ethical. So you have to make sure that that intention is made because you want to do the right thing and maintain the ethics of the situation, honor moral principle, and act according to the moral law and enact your duty as a moral decision maker. Rather than be a good employee, get a raise, help, solve the need of one particular group which may then conflict with another stakeholder group and so on. It's looking at the larger intention. Are you proceeding from a morally good will because the action is the right thing to do based on rational analysis and moral principles? And then finally, the larger arrow that's bracket shaped is a two-way communication flow. You'll notice arrows on each side because it asks you have you made sure to incorporate dialogue from all of the involved parties? Again, going back to the dignity and respect, second form of the categorical imperative. Maintaining dialogue and understanding helps to build long-term symmetrical and ethical issues management. And in so doing, you get a little bit closer toward the kingdom of ends, meaning that your decisions should help support ethical strategic issues management but should also help you fulfill your role as a moral decision maker and fulfill the organization's role as a responsible, ethical, and um, morally autonomous organization in society so that you're contributing something positive. You're not just acting in your own self-interest. You're acting more in accordance with the universal kingdom of ends, which is the ideal for how things we would want to see should happen if everything was perfect and everyone was ethical all the time. It is a bit of a thought test, but the closer you get to that normative ideal, the better your decisions will be. And if you use this model to think through your ethical decisions, you're always going to have a better result and a more ethical decision than if you go by gut instinct, seat of the pants, experience, hunches, guessing, um, hoping for the best, saying, well, I have good intentions, so maybe that's enough. Really thinking through these types of considerations makes you a better ethical decision maker because you're weighing a multiplicity of perspectives and your decisions become more rigorous. So thank you for joining me today. I hope I'll see you again. Bye-bye.